Welcome to Product Success Management Issues, the podcast and video series that explores in depth with experienced product managers and product marketing managers the key issues that affect product success. Sponsored by Wiley and my company, Spice Catalyst, I am Dave Frayden, your host and the author of Foundations in the Successful Management of Products series of books and courses published by Wiley. Be sure to connect with me on LinkedIn. Be sure to connect with my guest also. Welcome. My guest is Clarence Hempfield, who's Vice President of Product Management in Location Intelligence at uh, Pitney Bowes. Welcome to the uh, show, uh, Clarence. Thanks for having me, David. Pleasure to be here. The, uh, tell us a little bit about what you do uh, at Pitney Bowes and what the Location Intelligence is all about. Sure. So effectively, I run our location intelligence business within Pitney Bowes. So over the years, PB has moved from being kind of a, a, a mail centric technology provider towards a whole range of things, including shipping, e-commerce. But a few years back, uh, dating back to 2004, they acquired a series of software companies, one of which was a company called MapInfo. Another was Group One Software. I originally came from a small company based in the DC area called Group One Software. Those two companies coming together formed what is now Software Solutions. We've had a series of acquisitions since to grow our Software Solutions business. But to get back to kind of my role within the company, so I run what was effectively the old Map Info business or location intelligence business. So for those who aren't as familiar, it's using kind of address centric information, your addresses tied to the physical location that it occupies on the globe. Uh, so GPS uh, uh, coordinates, if you will. Uh, and then from that information to be able to determine a series of uh, useful pieces of information that many of our customers, whether they're in public sector, insurance, telecommunications, et cetera, uh, will use it to glean information about their customers, about various assets that they're managing uh, and, and the, the fusion of the two. Gotcha. Yeah, I, we were chatting earlier. I spoke to a worldwide meeting of Pitney Bowes uh, product managers back in 2012, and I, I write about it in my book, uh, Building Insanely Great Products. And it was quite interesting that uh, the fellow speaking uh, meeting ahead of me was the chairman of the board. And at that time, you guys were about a five billion dollar a year company, and you were acquiring these data firms in the UK, if I recall, in Denver. Uh, Singapore, I think, uh, certainly Australia, and uh, we're selling this data to government agencies and to uh, uh, law enforcement and that type of thing. And and he was talking about how critical the role of product management was at Pitney Bowes. And most people don't know what Pitney Bowes does uh, because they've never seen one of your machines putting postage on a lot of stuff. Uh, I used to have several of those, but the little ones, of course. And uh, and he said that uh, Wall Street was hammering Pitney Bowes because they figured the mailing of stuff, of physical stuff, is going to go away with the advent of the of the internet. Uh, so it's been a very nice strategic pivot. But on the other hand, with uh, outfits like Amazon around, uh, I try not to go to the store anymore because I can't find anything. Whereas I can go on Amazon and two or three clicks, it shows up miraculously at my doorstep uh, a couple days later. That's a perfect example of how both the hardware side of the business as well as the software part of the business have kind of collaborated to help bring PB from that kind of back office postage oriented business both on the desktop, as you mentioned, but also the large inserter and mailing machines that large organizations, banks, et cetera, will utilize. But to your point, as companies began to ship like Amazon, eBay, et cetera, much, both of which are uh, large customers of ours to help with that shipping part of the business, particularly shipping uh, 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 su- uh, supplies, but products to customers and other around the globe, we help with that, a lot of that cross-border shipping for those organizations. But then those same organizations will use, particularly our location intelligence technology, when they want to better understand their customers, help create kind of profiles of customers so that they can target both their existing customers more effectively and also find prospective customers that can look like those customers better. Um, But also we have a a wide array of kind of data management technologies to help them to better identify their customers across their various operational systems within their organization. Yeah, and the fascinating thing is that you guys are making a successful transformation to a digital world. Uh, many companies struggle with that. Uh, you know, Apple was hammered for years 
about being just a hardware electronic gadgets company. And Tim Cook, three, four years ago, started talking about their services business. And Wall Street has just begun to pay attention. And the P.E. ratios on Apple have gone up from about 12 to the last time I looked at, at about 20. Yet uh, Amazon is, I think, up around about 50. And we'll, we won't talk about Tesla, but uh, there's only seven moving parts in a Tesla car, which is pretty remarkable. So with a software upgrade, you can change how the switches look and which, which knobs you, you dial and that type of thing. Absolutely. I wanted to talk a, a little more specifically about how your product management is organized. How, how many product managers do you have uh, reporting to you? So specifically in my group, there's 17. And are all of they in Washington or are they uh, worldwide? No, they're, they're scattered around the globe. Probably my largest concentration are based out in our Boulder offices in Colorado. Um, but I have people from uh, basically in all portions of the U.S., uh, a couple in the U.K., uh, another in uh, India as well. Um, uh, yes, we're completely spread out. Uh, how are they organized? Broadly speaking, they're organized around the ways in which we deliver our products to our customers. So within my business, we have some desktop-oriented uh, products. We have some server-based products. And then what we're doing in the cloud. So effectively, my product managers are scattered across kind of those three areas. So there, you have product managers for the cloud, product managers for the desktop, and so forth. Yes. How do you deal with the uh, um, a user, for example, that's moving between those different platforms? That's a great question because many of our customers do. Now, for us, uh, we have some customers who are uh, who will utilize one of our longest running products on the desktop. But they oftentimes require some of our server-based technology that we've developed over the years. So I'll use that as a good example. Those two product managers, the one who manages the flagship desktop product, as well as our primary server-based solution, will, will work together almost on a daily basis to compare notes from their own individual customer uh, interviews, but also at times when they'll interview customers together. Um, so they spend a lot of time both together as well as communicating with each other's engineering teams to share the insights that they're gathering across their customer engagements. How about the user interface? Um, so that's a great question in the sense that, uh, one, we spend a lot of time refocusing our efforts on kind of user experience, user design across all of our various products. Uh, uh, where you might be going with the question is, uh, what we try to do is make sure there's consistency across our various products, even though the users might be very different. Um, somebody who traditionally is using our desktop product, for example, isn't necessarily the primary user of one of our server-based technologies. But if they happen to uh, change roles and they have to start to interface with our server-based technology, we want it to be familiar to them to cut down on that uh, learning experience so they can get up and running with that product much more quickly. What would be the persona of each of those, uh, I'm going to use the term platforms, cloud-based, server-based, and, and uh, uh, mobile so generally speaking, what we try to do is appeal to kind of business people. Um, uh, location intelligence is effectively built on top of a much more technical topic called geospatial information systems. Um, historically, GIS was used by specialists within an organization. And one of the ways in which we try to make ourselves different from our competitors was rather than focus on those people who went to school for GIS and just cater to that group, we wanted to, we saw the, the, the need for our technology by the more everyday business person, analyst, uh, a marketing person, even an executive. And so to get back to your question, we've always tried to gear our products towards that type of user being able to be successful with our products. So at times we may not offer quite as many pieces of, of, of functionality uh, in favor of ease of use. Or when there is something that's uh, relatively complex, try to distill it down to its most basic uh, level so that a business person can make use of it without having to go through a tremendous amount of training. So uh, for the cloud uh, customer, what would that persona be, for example? Okay, great. Uh, let, me, let me pivot on that on two areas. We have some developer-oriented cloud solutions, which a developer, some soft, a smaller software company who may want to include some of our software and data but doesn't want to uh, install it physically into their product might use those APIs. So that's more of a very technical uh, yeah. uh, user. Uh, we have a couple of uh, SaaS applications where, again, it's a business person um, who ha we have a fairly lightweight application so they can interact with. So, for example, in, in the U.S., we have something called geotext.com. 
It's a perfect application for small businesses, which traditionally we don't sell to as a business, but small businesses who sell a product or service, but they need to accurately identify the taxes they should be charging for their customer. And so this technology kind of grew from some server-based technology we had that we used to sell, we still do sell to large telecommunications companies, insurance companies, et cetera. We need to do this on a, a very high kind of volumes. The local dealership down the street from your home uh, probably has five or 10 salespeople who need to calculate sales tax for individual cars that they're selling that month. And so that particular application of the geotax technology is designed for somebody like a salesperson at a car dealership or the small business owner of a propane dealership, that type of organization. So again, kind of business people, not technical, uh, who need to get uh, kind of access to the technology, get to an answer very quickly compared to the APIs, which are more oriented towards a developer. Gotcha. Uh, how are those 17 product managers organized? Do they all report to you or do they report up to directors? They report up to directors, and those directors report to me. And then who do you report to? I report to our chief operating officer within the software unit. Perfect. That's what I've been advocating worldwide. Uh, the next thing I'll advocate is that you change your title to vice president of product success. That's a great suggestion. And, and, and change the titles of all of your product managers to product success managers. And the reason being it is I put a funny little memo on my, uh, uh, in a blog on my, on my Spice Catalyst website that said, uh, the reason I advocate the change is that whenever I go to a cocktail party and there's a very nice looking lady there, I start talking to her and she says, occasionally, what do you do? And I say, I'm a product manager. And she says, what's that? Yes. I said, well, I try to figure out what our customers want to do. And I define their personas and uh, I do market research and competitive research. And then I do product positioning and then I identify target markets. And usually before I finish the first phrase of that, she turns and walks away. <laughs> So I, I say in this humorous memo that I encourage people to download and doctor it up and send it to their boss and that uh, if you would allow me to please change my title to product success manager, then maybe I could get married. And if I do, I'll invite you to the wedding. But you make a great point, though. A lot of times what we, we spend a good uh, proportion of our time on is, is helping our customers be successful. So, uh, well, I think it's the product well, and the product, too. Absolutely. And so while you said it's somewhat in jest, there's a lot of truth to it. And that's where we spend most of our time anyways. Yeah, it was a couple months ago. This uh, We're recording this in, where was it, September uh, 2018. Uh, I was in uh, Bangalore, uh, Manipal Pro Learn University, of which uh, I'm a, they call me a distinguished professor, but my daughter still won't give me any respect. So, uh, And they had me speak at uh, Dell, Philips, Himalaya Drugs, Bosch, and Samsung. And I was advocating the title change. And uh, when I was chatting with the vice presidents of product management afterwards, they said dozens of their product managers came up to them asking if they could change their title. Interesting. Uh, one interesting thing is one of those companies who will remain un, uh, unidentified says the parent company back in Korea will not allow them to change their titles. I said, well, just don't show them your business card. You know I mean? <laughs> exactly. For your product managers, what are their roles and responsibilities? So probably at the, the most basic level, we, we do treat them as if they own the P&L for their individual product or products. Some of them manage multiple products. And so uh, yeah, I was looking at uh, um, uh, some of the questions kind of more broadly. And, and so while they're the place where it stops at the end, they're the ones who, whether it's myself, our COO, or our, our the president of our business, when we ever have questions about the profitability of a product, we always go to product management first. But they are attached to the hip uh, with their product marketing uh, person uh, because they're an excellent team in that the, the product manager owns kind of everything. They spend a lot of time, not only with customers, partners, uh, the engineering team, of course, but oftentimes they have their product marketing person along with them. And, and between the two of them, uh, I, I try to uh, uh, require that they spend as much time out talking to customers together as, as, as possible uh, because they both kind of listen oftentimes different ways. They'll pick up on different things. And between the two of them, it, it then helps the product uh, marketing person do a better job of communicating our products to kind of the outside wider world. 
um, more often than uh, the typical product uh, manager who's generally looking for, he or she is tending to look for the next new product feature, the next new innovation, and not necessarily a language on how best to uh, sell that product in the market. The messaging. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, does the product marketing manager report to the product manager? Uh, currently in our organization, no. So product marketing reports up through our marketing organization, ah. but there's this kind of informal team that they're on. The The product managers then report up to you right to the COO. Yes. They report up to the VP of marketing, yes. uh, who then in turn reports to the COO. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, so it sounds like they're roughly organized. Your guys uh, at Gals are uh, what Pragmatic calls inbound product management, and the marketing guys are outbound. Yes, that's the easiest way to look at it. And we, we spend a lot of time sending product managers across Pitney Bowes to the Pragmatic classes. And over time, we've kind of embraced that model as well. Yes. Gotcha. Then um, when you started with this company that was acquired by Pitney Bowes, um, how big was it? Uh, or how big was it when you started? And more importantly, the what differences do you see in product management, uh, or I should say product success management, uh, from uh, when you were smaller to now being in a multi-billion dollar corporation? Sure. So I, I want to say when Group One was acquired, we were around a two hundred fifty million dollar business. Uh, um, so you know we're you know, more than double that presently within Software Solutions. I always have to be careful because we generally don't report revenue below uh, the business unit level. That's okay. Wall Street's tuned into this. <laughs> um, I, I think the the biggest uh, changes I've noticed over the years were uh, Pitney Bowes as a whole takes, uh, particularly under current leadership, Mark Lottenbach, our, our CEO, takes uh, product management extremely important. Uh, I would even argue that with our, one of our first CEOs, at least when I came on board through the acquisition, uh, Murray Martin, um, even back towards my time as part of Group One Software as a separate entity, uh, product management was seen as a necessary evil back then. <laughs> Whereas today, it's a vital, important piece of the organization that is looked at to drive the business not only today, but where we're going in the future. That's probably been the biggest change over the years. Why did that occur? Why did that change occur? Um, well, I think some of it was due to Mark's past experience with IBM. So he came to us from, from IBM. Uh, he was always, when he ran a significant part of their business, he worked closely with kind of product management leadership there. And so there were certain elements that he wanted to uh, bring the Pitney Bowes as, as well. And some of his senior staff, so the president of our business, uh, Bob Gadotti, had joined us from IBM as well. And those two saw the world very similarly, uh, uh, where product management takes a, a leadership role within the organization. And so they helped kind of facilitate change within the business to put kind of product management on the forefront of growing the business. Plus, it sounds like you guys uh, stepped up to the plate and have been doing a good job. Like the think so, yes. Yeah. The, uh, you may not know this, but when I was researching uh, the topic for my books and for my uh, courses, uh, I couldn't find necessarily the title product manager at IBM. Hmm. They call it all sorts of different things. Uh, some of them are called analysts, and certainly an IT business analyst. I did a comparison of their competencies to a product manager's competencies, and they're very similar, uh, except in their case, they get the specification uh, from the customers what they want in the IT world. Uh, do you have any comments about the titles at uh, IBM and, and how they differ or are the same? So I can't comment specifically on IBM, um, but I do because I have met some people at IBM who do have the title of product management, but I think those were more in the software business. Yeah. Uh, but I haven't studied it wide enough to want to comment broadly. But to your point, as I've met people over the years at various events and others in my network, you're absolutely right that every organization is a little bit different. And there are some who seem to go out of their way not to call people product managers, even though when you look at their description, their job description, what they're doing is playing a product management or product success role. Um, and I, I, I can't quite wrap my mind around what is it within those organizations that prevents them from just labeling them what they actually are. It's because they want to get married. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, uh, 
when you're hiring a potential product manager, what uh, competencies or skill sets do you find uh, the most important? Great question. Um, I, I try to look at the individual and, and you know, are they an analytical person? Uh, uh, let me back up for a second. I, I'm not a huge fan of hiring somebody who has 10 years of experience in the space that I'm in. Um, because I think there are many technology you can learn in, in any industry that you're in. So I look for uh, good analytical skills of somebody who's a people person, somebody who's willing to kind of take chances, you know, kind of make um, uh, educated guesses. You know, we're, we're expecting you to create business plans and, and, and sell us on how successful something will be. But I guess the point I was trying to make is you never can have all of the information that you want at some point, you have to be comfortable in the assessment you've made and, and make the business case for why we should do something and take a little bit of a risk. And so over the years, I have been a bit frustrated with some who are with the organization who were always waiting until they had every piece of information before they would make that decision. And, and things are moving much too quickly <clears throat> for you to feel that you have all available information because that's not possible. But yeah, it's really around analytical skills, kind of being people oriented, um, uh, that kind of a thirst for knowledge, uh, and just uh, willing to take calculated risks. And the instincts of doing what will help the product be successful. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, through much of my career up until, only up until recently when we have big data available, I never had the information I needed to make decisions. But because I tried to get as close to my customer as possible, which is what HP taught me, uh, you kind of do because you watch yeah. what they do and you you interview them and ask questions and you you stay in the area of uh, of the problem so that the engineers can work in the world of the solution, and instinctively you would just feel uh, what was right. That's right. The um, is there any of those competencies that you value the most? Um. The most, uh, if out of the four that I mentioned, probably the, being able to take, being comfortable with taking a calculated risk. I, I think that those others um, help underpin it. But uh, you know, if you're somebody who is too tentative, it's it's tough. I think to be successful over the long term in a rapidly changing technology environment, which we've been in for a very very long time, uh, uh, and so. Uh, I guess on some level, I'm assuming the others, but then I really do value those who are willing to take calculated risks. And and on some level, you either reap the rewards or not necessarily uh, you get penalized for taking chances because that's something, at least with my, my team, I try to reinforce that if you take a chance on something and it's not successful, you're not getting fired for that. Um, if anything, you're getting fired for not taking chances and, and just being content on sitting still. So I, I just wanted to clarify that, that there is no real penalty for uh, failure against taking a calculated risk. Well, as you know, I want to go back to your uh, uh, P&L, general manager type uh, product uh, manager. Uh, the whole field started in 1932 with uh, brand management at Procter & Gamble. They were called brand managers. That I found in my research that Dave Packard and the other founders of HP uh, through Fred Tierman, knew uh, uh, McElroy, uh, I forget his first name, who wrote that memo. And in the case of Procter & Gamble, every president uh, of Procter & Gamble since came out of brand management. Those guys had budget. They had the money. They paid for the product marketing manager. They paid for the advertising. They paid for the market research. Do your guys have uh, budgetary authority? So they have their individual budgets. Uh, so yes, um, what we're moving toward, we, we're not quite where you're there, which you just mentioned. So we're moving that direction, putting more and more responsibility on the product manager to say, here is your pool of money for your products, spend it on marketing, spend it on development. Because sometimes, it is, I think your, your question was kind of alluding to, there are times when you need to make, I need to spend a little bit more on marketing, maybe a little bit less on development and vice versa. And so those are the decisions we're starting to push down specifically to the, the product managers. But absolutely, they do presently have uh, control of their budget for their products. And one of the reasons that Hewlett Packard grew 20% a year in sales every year for 50 years up until 1996 and uh, Carly Farina came in and blew that model up is that they always wanted 
all their divisions to be less than 500 people to be as close to the, the customer as possible. And uh, a few years ago, I was doing some consulting for a very large uh, networking company in their services business, which at the time was about $4 billion a year. And I called up their corporate market research department, and they had subscribed to 84 different market research uh, services. Not one of them, uh, by services I mean it was like the Gartners and the IDCs kind of services, not one of them uh, did they purchase the add-on that covered uh, uh, services as a business. So I said to them, could you get these four reports because I need it for the project that I'm doing uh, for the services group of this networking company. Uh, this was like in the spring, and they said, sure, I'll, our budget changes at the end of July. We'll probably get budgetary approval by about October, and we could buy these studies maybe May or uh, you know February, March the next year. I said, that's not going to help me. I'll, it's a nine-month project. But uh, back at HP, in a division, if we needed market research, we just went ahead and bought it because we had, we had the budget. Uh, yes. And that's one of the critical things that I advocate is give the product manager, who you're holding responsible for doing the job, the budget to make those decisions and not have to go out and beg uh, others uh, to give them the resources or to shift their resources around. Yeah, you're absolutely right. In fact, one example of how bad that could go is I was personally responsible for the success of the IBM PC XT when I was running uh, as the business unit manager of the Apple III product line. And that's because the advertising department bought ads for an accounting system and our uh, uh, software uh, for the Apple III. And uh, it was not yet running on the Apple III. So they ran a million dollars worth of ads in August of that month. And these, uh, the customers at the time, they didn't care about whether it was an Apple brand or an IBM brand. So they went into the dealerships and said, hey, I want to do some of that accounting on the Apple III. And the dealers, and they were driven in there by my money. But <laughs> the advertising department refused to not run the ads. I said, we already made the buys. We can't make the change. So they went into the dealerships and the I, and the, the salesperson in the dealership says, well, uh, I'm sorry, it doesn't run on an Apple III, but it runs over here on IBM PC XT. Would you like one? And I was following the sales on uh, the data quest reports and their sales went through the roof as we are running ads. And that for them, uh, because people were looking for a solution. So that's a, a negative example to not have much of a product success. Oh, absolutely. You mentioned something earlier that you uh, do not necessarily look at the domain expertise of the product manager that you hire. Could you uh, speak a little bit more about that? Sure. So I, I try not to. Um, well, what I found is at times when you hire somebody with a tremendous amount of domain expertise, they can kind of refer back to building the product that they're used to, not necessarily what customers want. And so we've had some painful experiences with that in the past. And so while we're focused, as I was mentioning before, very much on delivering capabilities to business people, uh, it, it was just it became apparent that uh, hiring good, solid people who didn't necessarily have a tremendous amount of domain expertise building certain things, uh, maybe who worked in a different but related industry of some sort, that those people oftentimes prove better than somebody with a tremendous amount of domain expertise. Not to say that you can't find somebody who can think uh, um, uh, broadly enough, but more often than not, you have people who fall back into building the things that they, they're used to. Yeah, that's music for my ears because I've been advocating this for a long time. And recently, a lot of people say, oh, no, you got to look at the domain expertise before you hire them. And uh, typically, like you say, the ones they say, well, we don't do it that way. We didn't do it that way over there. And then we were successful. Uh, so that's sort of like a, a guy on a train in the caboose looking backwards and the, 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 the tra train tracks up ahead are out. Uh, exactly. but they don't know it till they hit it. Uh, so, yeah, I believe very strongly in that. And now with Wikipedia, I can become a better expert than the engineers on a particular technology in just two or three weeks. Uh, but, of course, I'm, I'm a trained engineer. I know how to solve problems. And most people that know how to solve problems uh, and have uh, some technical uh uh, nomenclature or vo vocabulary uh, can figure these things out and then identify opportunities. And, and sometimes asking what you believe is a dumb question ends up uncovering the, the most uh, fascinating things. Whereas people with a tremendous amount of domain expertise just assume they know what the person meant rather than asking that uh, quote unquote dumb question. 
Yeah, uh, there's a, um, a famous television detective by the name of, uh, I forget his name offhand, he, he walked around in a trench coat, and he oh. acted dumb as hell, and he would say things like, uh, 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 I'm really confused about this, help me out. It, it's yeah. amazing the things that you uncover that you never thought of. Uh, exactly. I did an interview with a lady uh, the other day for the, for this show, and uh, let's see if I got her name here. No, I don't. Uh, but... Uh, she said that in her business, they have products that are at the mature stage. I'll call them, according to the Boston uh, Consulting Group, the cash cow. Mm -hmm. Then they have products that were um, uh, just kind of getting started, but sort of emerging. And then yes. they had brand new startup types of products. So they have their product managers organized in those three categories, which is a brilliant organizational structure because typically – uh, uh, senior management can't keep the parameters and the metrics clear on each of those three things. Uh, typically, the, you know, for, if it's a startup kind of thing, it's, well, we got to make $12 billion next year, and this little thing here is only $100,000, so therefore your baby is ugly and we don't want anything to do with it. That's right. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. I, I've thought about structuring our group that way as well because we have products along kind of that same spectrum. Ultimately, I decided to go with the approach that I had mentioned to you a bit earlier, even though within that, there are certain people working on kind of the cash cows and others who are working on kind of the, the startup types of technologies, uh, but still within those those categories. And what you just said is absolutely true. It's, it's, it's always toughest with something that is in that kind of startup phase where maybe you needed to do some investment up front, particularly if it's a cloud-based solution. So your costs are kind of front-loaded. And yet the revenue hasn't yet caught up. There's this natural kind of reaction to want to start you know, cutting funding for something like that. Uh, and so you have to work really hard, particularly at my role, to keep people on the same page of you know, using different metrics, showing how it's growing, how quickly it's growing, uh, start uh, um, uh, maybe funneling more marketing uh, money to it to help kind of keep that ember uh, glowing. Uh, while at the same time, using your cash cows to maybe help protect it a little bit. Gotcha. Well, thank you very much, Clarence. Glad to, that uh, you're able to join us. Oh, thank you. uh, you've been listening to and watching uh, product success management issues with the vice president of product management at Pitney Bowes, uh, Clarence Hepfield. Uh, thanks, you. thanks again, Clarence. Thank you, David. I appreciate it. Thanks for joining us on product success management issues. I am Dave Frayton. Be sure to connect with us on LinkedIn.